Today's the day that the Illinois Supreme Court hears oral arguments in the challenge against Illinois' gun and magazine ban. What do you expect to happen? I'd love to hear from you at 217-629-7970. It is Springfield's Morning News on 92.7 WMAY, Springfield's News and Talk. And again, you can always chime in live and local every weekday morning from 6 to 9 by calling in 217-629-7970. You can also email me, Bishop on air at gmail.com com or message me on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Uh, so be sure to uh, connect that way. It's been a, a long uh, slog here in the past few months after January 10th, Governor J.B. Pritzker enacted the Protect Illinois Communities Act. The measure, it prohibits the sale and possession of more than 170 different semi-automatic guns, shotguns, pistols, rifles, and it also prohibits the sale and possession of of magazines of more than 15 rounds for handguns and more than 10 rounds for rifles. And this uh, measure also does a variety of other things. It increases the orders of protection from six months to a year. It uh, provides for a, uh, a gun trafficking task force uh, and a variety of other things. But to the guns, it also requires that individuals who had these banned guns before January 10th of this year, they have to register those with Illinois State Police by January 1st of 2024. This is obviously something that's very contentious, uh, allegations that there are uh, violations of uh, the Second Amendment and also equal protections, which is where the state level cases come in to challenge the state law. And you had several cases that were filed from states, uh, Rather, the, the state-level cases, you had several cases filed by Attorney Thomas DeVore, uh, the former Republican candidate for Attorney General, uh, and he's actually secured thousands of temporary restraining orders protecting individuals and gun stores from having the law enforced against them. Uh, so divorce cases are still playing around in the in the lower courts, uh, but it was the case brought by uh, State Representative Dan Hawkins out of Macon County that was similar but separate and a little different than divorce cases, allegations of uh, equal protection violations, but also the, the, the Calkins case uh, dealt with uh, special legislation. And this is obviously uh, what you're going to hear a lot about when the Illinois Supreme Court goes to hear those oral arguments uh, come today. Uh, and uh, the, the arguments are going to start at 9 o'clock. There's two cases. I, I think the Calkins case is going to be the second case heard, but you can find this by going to the Illinois Supreme Court's website, illinoiscourts.gov, and they will be live streaming video of the arguments. So if you go to the, uh, the website, illinoiscourts.gov, you highlight over courts, and then you go to Oral Arguments, Audio, and Video, and you click on that link, and there you'll see uh, the, uh, the, the the list of previous uh, court oral arguments. But if you go to the docket and briefs, and the docket and briefs is where you're going to find uh, the various cases uh, that are, are already heard, but the one that's coming up today, you've got uh, the live stream link there, and you can even read uh, all of the uh, the briefs in the Dan Calkins v. Governor Pritzker brief. Uh, so, uh, obviously, this is going to be something we will uh, monitor today and bring you all the highlights tomorrow. Uh, but let's get into some of the arguments here that have already been raised. Um, and this is obviously uh, going to be a big day because you've got, uh, you know, the challenges in the Illinois Supreme Court uh, looking at those uh, equal protections violations that they allege. Uh, because the law, while, yes, it bans 170-plus semi-automatic guns and uh, magazines over certain capacities, but it also carves out police, retired police, individuals who work in the security sectors, individuals who work in the law enforcement sectors like jails and prisons. It carves them out, and it's not enforceable against those individuals, but it is enforceable against everybody else, and that's where you get the uh, equal protection violations. Now, attorney Jerry Stocks, who represents Dan Calkins uh, and a pawn shop owner in Decatur, plus the um, law-abiding gun owners of Macon County, a new association that was created for this lawsuit, uh, attorney Jerry Stocks representing all of them, he was able to secure a temporary restraining order in the Macon County Court, and the state directly appealed to the Illinois Supreme Court because the Fifth Circuit's 
Court of Appeals in Illinois, uh, already said that a separate case from Thomas DeVore could advance on its merits. Uh, so they took that precedence and bypassed the appellate court in the uh, Calkins case and went right to the Illinois Supreme Court. So um, you've got uh, that case going to be heard today. And uh, here is uh, attorney Jerry Stocks laying out some of the uh, the, the rationale behind what they say uh, is a, uh, a violation of equal protections uh, and uh, how they believe that uh, this law is not going to be enforced by sheriffs and state's attorneys uh, across the state. Here's uh, Jerry Stocks. From when I talked with him back in early March at the Macon County Courthouse. Dan has been uh, forthright from the get-go as to what his objectives were, and our objectives are to get a final determination of the constitutionality on the classification of the persons impacted by this statute. Federal cases will deal with the classification of the weapons defined by this statute. And it's, a, it's a very, it may seem, what does that mean? But that distinction is fairly significant. And uh, uh, so we're going to move forward. Uh, we are comfortable and confident in uh, the legal principles we have. But anyone in audience needs to understand is that there, both sides have things to say about this. Um, in, in the course of this litigation, and um, it needs to be fully vetted, vetted promptly, and not delayed uh, while this chaos and uncertainty exists. Uh, I mean, think about it. We have a majority of the sheriffs, state's attorneys, saying they won't enforce, they're going to nullify a law. We have persons, uh, the perspective we have, uh, that consider the law as an extreme encroachment upon a fundamental liberty, fundamental right, and it needs to be heard. And there are people in this state that say this regulation is needed. And uh, while we disagree with that, and, uh, but it still uh, uh, disputes actual controversies, and I, we believe we can get it uh, resolved more promptly and um, yeah. litigation is always uh, could be games of gotcha and what have you done here or there. But the parameters of this case, the eyes that are on it, uh, I, I think the risk of that is extraordinarily low. And uh, if the Supreme Court of Illinois wants to dodge confronting the issues head on, they're going to find a thousand different reasons to do so. Uh, and they can do that in any case. Uh, but I think every uh, level of the judiciary that is confronting this well recognizes the significance of the case, the issues presented, and the tough decisions that they need to make. And so I have faith in the judiciary that uh, people will be of good conscience and uh, uh, will evaluate these matters properly. So this was before uh, the revelations were dug up by Mom at Arms bloggers who found that uh, the the uh, two Supreme Court justices on the bench, uh, essentially, you know, they took campaign contributions from uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker and Illinois House Speaker Emanuel Chris Welch, uh, that are uh, rather large, a million dollars each from Pritzker and a uh, six-figure donation each from House Speaker Chris Welch. Uh, so that's another storyline in all of this we'll get to next and review again uh, what uh, some of the uh, then-justice candidates had to say about due process and equal protections and conflicts of interest, but also what Governor J.B. Pritzker had to say when I asked him about his million-dollar donation to those Supreme Court justices. So stay tuned. We'll get to that next here on Double. WMAY, I'm Greg Bishop. The Illinois Supreme Court going to hear oral arguments in the case against Illinois' gun and magazine ban, and there's still questions about conflicts of interest with two of the Illinois Supreme Court's justices that received a million dollars each from Governor J.B. Pritzker when they were candidates for the office. 
And uh, it is obviously something that uh, is already played out in the courts with the justices denying uh, the motion from State Representative Dan Calkins through Attorney Jerry Stocks to uh, recuse themselves. And in that recusal denial, uh, in particular, you have uh, Justice Elizabeth Rochford uh, saying that uh, they got to caution the courts, they got to consider whether attacks on a judge's impartiality are simply subterfuge to circumvent anticipated adverse rulings. Plaintiffs cast sinister uh, aspersions uh, that can contributions to my campaign committee were made to influence the instant litigation, Rochford said in April. Plaintiffs provide no factual basis for those aspersions. Now, Stocks, he stood by his motion, and in an email he gave me on... um, after this uh, uh, ruling came out from the Illinois Supreme Court justices, uh, he said that the suggestions that uh, as move-ins, uh, raising the issue that we had a burden to prove to show actual impartiality on the part of the justices is a contention with which we disagree. The decision has been made, and we turn to the merits of the challenge to the facially unconstitutional law. It is premature, he said, to determine the remedy, if any, for the participation of the justices if our view is valid. So what does that mean? I think that means that they may be able to take this to a higher court, the U.S. Supreme Court, if they don't get the outcome they want based off of the questions over conflicts of interest. Uh, I asked Governor J.B. Pritzker back in uh, March about the conflict of interest concerns, uh, and here's what the the governor had to say uh, to that question I posed. I, I am sure this is something that the right wing is trying to stir up. I know you've written about it. Um, the fact of the matter is I supported candidates who were running all across the board. Um, if you're suggesting that uh, the fact that I gave money to, let's say, the Democratic Party or to the committees that supported uh, candidates means that everybody who received any money has to recuse themselves from anything to do with the state of Illinois, that's ridiculous. And I've certainly never asked anybody to vote a certain way or decide on a case a certain way. I would never do that. I never have. I never will. Um, and these are independent judges, and they didn't go around and campaign on things you know, that, that they thought would win my support for them. I believe in them. I supported them like lots of other people did. So uh, Rochford actually did go around and campaign with uh, advocacy groups that want semi-automatic weapons to be banned. And that's something else that Mom at Arms, a online blog, has dug up to find those previous campaign uh, contributions back and forth and campaign events, holding up Mom's Demand Action cookies and things along those lines. So again, it it just raises the question as to... uh, conflicts of interest, and we'll hear from a couple of the justices when they were then candidates about the idea of conflicts of interest and due process and equal protections, but Governor J.B. Pritzker was asked again uh, just about a week or so after I initially asked him about his campaign contributions to these two Supreme Court justice candidates and him being a chief defendant in this case now in front of the Illinois Supreme Court today, Uh, and the question that was posed to him was, what were you hoping to get? from a million dollars each to these Supreme Court justice candidates back last year. Well, my hope is that good people get elected to public office. That's why I think you would contribute or anybody else in this room would contribute to somebody. I would also point out that, uh, you know, unlike uh, what some people are putting forward uh, among the right wing, the truth of the matter is that uh, my name is on these suits because I am an official representative of the state of Illinois. When I became governor, there were suits that were outstanding, and Rauner's name was removed from those suits, and my name was put on them. It had nothing to do with me specifically. Just- but people push back on that, saying it does have something to do with you specifically because you signed the Protect Illinois Communities Act back to Pritzker. It's the fact that I happened to be governor at that time and this time. Uh, So, you know, the the conflicts that have been alleged are just, you know, false. Uh, And I must say that I think people who run for judge uh, do it for the right reasons. Um, And I think that people who give to candidates for judge do it for the right reasons. And judges ultimately are required to do to make their independent decisions about the cases. Uh, and I, I think that's what judges that uh, any of us support should do and I hope will do. So again, uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker uh, several weeks ago responding to questions about 
concerns over conflicts of interest because of the million dollars he gave to each then candidates, Justice uh, Mary O'Brien and Elizabeth Rochford. Now, during the 2022 election for Supreme Court, Rochford, she was in front of the American Constitution Society, and she talked about the importance of being impartial and even the cloud of impartiality being detrimental to the uh, the public's confidence in the Supreme Court or any part of the judiciary. Here's Elizabeth Rochford. I am regularly reminded that even the members of the Illinois Supreme Court, when they are sitting in their courtroom in Springfield, on the back wall, there's a Latin phrase. It's Audi alterum partum. That translates to hear the other side. And the reason I think that's so powerful is that the justices of the Illinois Supreme Court need to be constantly reminded at the back of the room to really hear the other side, to hear the entirety of a case on both sides before they jump to a conclusion. Um, and so I think that's part of the journey um, is first acknowledging that these things are real. They exist for all of us. Um, and um, we're human beings, but we have a very important job to do. We're held to a higher standard. And, um, and also just uh, finally, that sometimes also even the appearance of bias. So you may not be acting in, in a, a way that it really is biased, but the way that you operate in your courtroom can present the impression of bias to other people. And sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's things you don't even think about. That's why you need to be constantly examining of yourself and the way that you run your courtroom, because you can give the impression to other people that it's a very clubby place or, you know, when they walk in, when somebody walks in a litigant scared to death and um, feels that they are an outsider in a courtroom and that other people are at an advantage, whether they are or aren't, just that appearance of bias is a dangerous thing and it undermines the credibility of our judicial system. So that was Elizabeth Rochford before she was elected talking about impartiality and the damage that even perceived impartiality can have on the judiciary. Mary O'Brien, a justice who got elected in 2022, uh, was with the women, uh, the League of Women Voters uh, for a forum talking about her candidacy. And here's some of what she had to say uh, about uh, the ideas of even uh, equal protections under the law. My vocation and my obligation is to provide a fair and impartial forum for people to resolve their disputes because that's what we do in a democracy. We don't run out in the streets and, and, and take up arms. When we don't get along, when we can't agree, we use our legal system. So I have dedicated the last 19 years of my life professionally to making sure that people have the two most basic tenets of democracy as it you know, <coughs> pertains to the judicial branch, and that's due process that you actually get your day in court and that you feel that you've been heard. And second is equal protection, that the laws apply the same to everyone, no matter what your economic status is or your social status, that the laws are gonna apply equally to everyone. And that's actually the argument that Dan Calkins is taking to the Illinois Supreme Court, and that case is going to be heard today, and you can find it again. Uh, go to the uh, Supreme Court's websites, and you'll find the uh, website where it talks about the dockets and briefs, and then you'll see uh, the actual video link for the uh, Supreme Court's uh, hearing today uh, at uh, IllinoisCourts.gov, all right? And they will be uh, opening that up at 9 o'clock, and the way they've got it listed here, uh, they've got one case before they actually take on the Calkins v. Pritzker case. So uh, we will be reviewing that tomorrow morning uh, in its entirety. All right, we'll take all the highlights and give you that and have you sound off on it as well. But I'd love to hear from you at 217-629-7970. What do you think is going to happen here? Is the Illinois Supreme Court going to uh, side with the states or are they going to recognize the questions of equal protections violations that are being alleged here? Uh, so we'll definitely uh, hear from you throughout the morning and you can always sound off on the chat. At, email me bishoponair at gmail.com. Stay tuned. We've got much more coming up on WMAY.